now it's uh, okay recording is in progress thank you <laughs> and uh, yeah uh, my main point is to raise concern about uh, what may go wrong to just have it uh, in the back of your head when you are and not only writing an application when you are using it as well as testing it uh, that uh, sometimes some uh, really well hidden bug may not be an issue of uh, somebody's PC, but uh, it may be something that uh, needs some deeper investigation. Yeah, I guess that uh, some of you also may have some multi-threading uh, troubleshooting stories or some nasty bugs. I wanted to ask you about it, but I cannot see the chat from uh, my PC right now. So feel free to write it uh, later on and I will share you mine most probably. Uh, yeah, the agenda for today is uh, not covering the full topic, unfortunately, because we only have uh, one hour and uh, this topic is uh, an actual iceberg, especially if you dive deeper into ways uh, some particular architectures try to mitigate the things I will talk about uh, later. I will tell you what uh, is a process and a thread, uh, what sort of uh, control mechanisms uh, do they need to work properly and uh, as the showtime point, uh, what can go wrong and uh, what to do about it. There are some more topics uh, which also should be raised, uh, but I decided to mention them on the second part of this lecture, which hopefully will take place someday. Uh, because, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, I remember that back in uh, time on the university, I had a full lecture which lasted for like two semesters, uh, only covering this uh, one topic. So one hour is uh, maybe enough to do some very nice summary, but uh, not enough to go really deep into some uh, cases. Okay, so let's start with a short theoretical part. Something uh, some of you most probably already know, but uh, just for the introduction and to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, what is concurrency? Uh, here, uh, yeah, my initial uh, request was to write about it in the chat, but uh, I may ask uh, you if uh, you want to answer, what is your first association with uh, concurrency in uh, programming? Okay, you may have some more time. I will take a sip of my tea. And we have say it's a parallel execution of instruction or simultaneous access to, to the memory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, your answer is right. A completely different uh, approach to the same answer is that uh, it's just another way of uh, optimization of code execution. And uh, as each way of optimizing uh, code execution or performance, it comes with some good sides and some uh, bad sides. And uh, yeah, as you said, uh, it's a way to make a single system perform several independent uh, activities in uh, parallel. It can uh, also happen if you only have uh, one core, you just uh, switch between uh, tasks. Uh, you can also do it in a concurrent or parallel way if you have uh, several cores, uh, which are just assigned to some uh, isolated uh, tasks. How can it be done? Well, we'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, and uh, why is it great? Why do we like this form of optimization? 
Yeah, because it's uh, allowed us to do more than one thing at once, you can, for example, access multiple applications or multiple sources at the same time, perform similar operations in parallel, which is uh, really cool, for example, in case of DSP. And generally, uh, if uh, some things uh, can be run independently from each other, it's really nice for us uh, that we don't need to serialize it. It can just happen and finish in their own time. It also starts with a nice topic of asynchronous programming, which I will talk about on the second lecture, I think. And uh, yeah, one more thing, why it's a great uh, approach in programming is that uh, it uh, keeps uh, related things uh, together and uh, irrelated things uh, separated, which is really great uh, when uh, you want uh, to simplify your code structure or your testing. And yeah, as I said, uh, it's a nice performance uh, boost, uh, which uh, can uh, be done both for task execution as well as uh, access to your data. However, there are some problems. Uh, the main problems, uh, uh, not uh, the nasty ones and uh, nasty situations you can run into, I will tell you about later. Uh, the problems are testing and uh, reproduction, because if everything can happen at once, we don't have any, actually we have some, but uh, generally we don't have that much uh, warranty that uh, threads will be executed uh, in a particular way. And uh, yeah, bug reproduction is uh, really problematic. Uh, we will talk about it uh, a lot uh, in a moment. So here is, uh, example of uh, what is a thread and uh, process. These are two main entities uh, which we use in different approaches to concurrency. A process is, uh, well, just some sort of a program which owns some uh, resources, as uh, you can see on the right-hand side, like uh, it's own a piece of memory, some address space, uh, identifier, and some context, uh, as you can see in this process control block. Whoop, I think you can see it now. Um, yeah. OK, something is blinking. It's not me. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, very safe and uh, isolated from the rest of the resources, but it's uh, heavy to start and uh, heavy to manage. Uh, also, what is important is uh, that processes by default don't share much information with, it, with each other as uh, they should be isolated. And uh, you need to use some inter-process communication between them to communicate uh, in any way. And what's important in uh, C or C++ standard, there is uh, no definition how it should, should look like from the standard perspective. So it's uh, very heavily up to the use case and implementation. And uh, each process can launch its all threads, which are, well, some sort of small programs uh, within a program. And uh, threads are very lightweight. Uh, they have uh, access to all the resources uh, within the resource pool of the process. It's great, but they don't have any additional data protection. And uh, just like processes, uh, they need uh, some, let's say, paperwork or maintenance time to be created and uh, destroyed. Meaning that uh, if you just create uh, two threads, it uh, doesn't mean that uh, your code will be executed uh, twice as fast even though we wish uh, we wanted. I don't know if uh, you recall this uh, processor instruction uh, cycle, which uh, was the standard uh, nasty question on all the exams uh, in the university classes, uh, where there were some phases of execution. And uh, even if you had several cores, there were some instructions completely blocking this uh, pipeline. 
And uh, yeah, what is executed uh, in a safe way? Uh, it's a part of code which is called the critical section. It uh, needs to be executed serially. It means that only one thread at a time should execute this part because otherwise uh, its result could be unpredictable. It needs to be somehow made sure that uh, it's uh, not executed in some uh, different way. And uh, usually it is a place where some data shared among uh, threads or applications is uh, modified. And uh, yeah, you can imagine that uh, many bad things may happen if uh, let's say we need to update a parameter and uh, notify some watchers. If only part of this uh, instruction may happen, uh, then uh, the programmer and uh, the user are going to have a very, very bad time, as you can imagine. Yeah, let's switch to example number one in Godbolt. Uh, now trying to move uh, between applications, what is what requires some short technical break from me. So sorry for waiting. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, here it is. And yeah, here is a very, very basic example. I just need to launch it. And uh, now the difficult part, meaning sharing the screen correctly. Yay, so here we are back in Godbolt. Yeah, this is a really simple example of creating one task that does something. We can create another task as well, doing uh, the same thing. Uh, now let's create several tasks uh, doing uh, different uh, things and uh, we'll observe some nice thing. Here basically it's a task taking no additional examples, just some parameter. This is actually the example I wanted to show you first. Here we have a vector of uh, the spread objects. And uh, once uh, this uh, object is created, task starts its execution. And uh, yeah, as you can see, here we create these tasks uh, in a loop uh, and uh, some naive person could assume that, okay, we first created task uh, taking zero as an argument and our last task is taking 10 as an argument join function just waits for particular thread to finish. So why don't we have uh, zero, one, and so on, up to nine uh, in execution, because they all happen at the same time. Here there's some way to relaunch uh, this way. So yeah, as you can see, each time the execution order is completely different. Even here, the task you've created first uh, is the last one to finish. Uh, you can create, of course, uh, several tasks uh, executing uh, different functions. It's uh, also possible. So it's uh, a very basic uh, approach uh, how uh, tasks uh, are created and then executed. Going back to the presentation, there is very motivational example. There will be one more, which will be a bit uh, more complicated. Yeah, back from current slide and back to sharing, yay. Next time I think I will just share all the presentation and all the desktop. 
And uh, yeah, there are different uh, ways uh, to handle multi-threading. Uh, some uh, say that a better way is to just create concurrent programs so that there are several processes which are heavily isolated and uh, some additional work is needed to make them communicate and uh, share some information, messages, resources uh, among them usually some additional middleware application, which is a neat approach. And uh, there is also a lightweight approach basing on processes creating many threads. And uh, these threads uh, can uh, use uh, all the resources uh, shared among uh, the process. And uh, yes, yeah, so here uh, some people may say, okay, so processes are heavy. They need some extra code to communicate with each other. Can we just create many threads doing some things, so to say? Because uh, we'll not use a lot of resources to create them as we need for processes. Uh, but uh, it's not as easy as it seems because uh, there is this limitation of thread safety. And uh, what is thread safety? It would be easier to reply you if there was an explicit definition in the C++ standard. There is none, but luckily there is some in a POSIX standard saying that uh, function is thread safe if it can be invoked concurrently with other calls to the same uh, function or with uh, some calls uh, within different uh, thread safe functions. So that uh, let's say it can be called in uh, many places in the same time and uh, its result uh, won't uh, be affected by how many times it is called simultaneously. Does it mean that each function is thread safe? Uh, well, not really. There is also so-called thread compatibility parameter. If uh, some function is able to invoke its uh, const uh, methods, uh, meaning that uh, its uh, internal parameters are not changed within uh, the method concurrently, it is thread compatible. It uh, doesn't mean that it's uh, thread uh, safe. It's, uh, let's say, not a perfect case, but also fine for multi-threading. Here, of course, we need to make sure that all the parameters which are const, meaning that they are not changed within the body of the function, are not having the const uh, keyword uh, removed in uh, any way. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what you're doing, C++ uh, has uh, many mechanisms uh, to allow you unconstify things as well as constify things, especially in the latest standards. And uh, all other methods are considered, here's a nice keyword, thread hostiles. Uh, what uh, do we do if uh, something is uh, thread hostile? We need to somehow synchronize uh, externally these uh, methods so that we are safe to use them. I mean, we are sure that uh, no matter how many times and uh, in how many places we call these functions, uh, they will give us a deterministic result. Or in the worst case, uh, there is some additional knowledge. Uh, how can they be accessed or used safely? Like, okay, this method uh, can be called, but only in this one place, because if we call it in this other place, uh, there is some side effect and it will break uh, stuff very heavily in your application. Uh, it should be mentioned anywhere in the documentation. Sometimes it is, sometimes it uh, isn't, uh, but a great way is uh, when creating your own code or documentation is just to explicitly state uh, if, uh, the uh, if some methods are thread safe, thread compatible or thread uh, hostile, or just assume that everything around is uh, thread hostile, but uh, if you are getting too paranoid about it or so, you're losing some CPU time on creating additional logs. So keep that in mind. 
Okay, now some short uh, fragment about synchronization mechanisms. I guess uh, you are uh, aware of uh, all of them, but uh, just to make sure we are on the same page. Uh, yeah, as you've already seen, for the threat hostile methods, uh, especially because most methods are threat hostile, doing everything uh, at once uh, is uh, great, but uh, sometimes it requires some extra effort to make sure that uh, the intended uh, plan uh, will actually take place and there will be uh, no uh, problems uh, with uh, multi-threading. So the most popular synchronization or access control mechanisms are mutexes and uh, semaphores. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, mutex uh, can be this uh, door to the shop, uh, which is some sort of a locking mechanism. Like in COVID times, only one person was allowed to be in the shop. And uh, so sort of a lock was acquired and everyone else was waiting outside, imagine you being uh, this thread, until same lock is uh, released. Of course, uh, there can be multiple locks. Uh, semaphore is uh, rather a signaling mechanism than a lock in can be, or it usually is just some integer value representing something like number of uh, free resources shared between several threads. For example, there is a file where uh, four members can work on it at the same time, each one doing a different thing or in a different part of this file. And uh, this uh, number of uh, threads currently working on this file is shared somewhere. And uh, each thread, uh, once it's uh, done with introducing its own changes, it just signals uh, that, uh, okay, I'm done, another thread can uh, come in. And uh, yeah, then uh, uh, it is controlled so that uh, there won't be, for example, uh, more threads uh, working on this shared uh, resource at uh, any given time because uh, it's uh, not allowed. There's also memory barrier or member or a fence. Uh, that's how atomic variables are in internally implemented uh, in uh, C++. It's uh, some sort of, uh, let's say, a hint to the compiler mostly that uh, says, uh, or to the CPU, that, okay, you are allowed to optimize uh, many things, but uh, all instructions which are before the fence needs to be committed before these things uh, happening after this uh, fence instruction are even uh, started and uh, there is uh, no option for these instructions to occur in any different uh, order or direction. Personally, I've seen them uh, heavily in GPSD, I think, uh, where some uh, writes of uh, GPS uh, data were written and then converted into different uh, sort of uh, data. Yeah, it's uh, really important uh, because uh, one of the uh, horror story with multi-threading of my friends was that they forgot about uh, creating memory barriers. And uh, as a result, uh, their application worked uh, fine in uh, debug, but uh, once uh, they switched to release, it went completely wrong because uh, some uh, memory writes and reads were just optimized out. However, they couldn't be optimized out from the end user perspective. So yeah, many things may go wrong. There's also another rabbit hole topic of uh, additional instructions for memory barriers, meaning uh, what is allowed uh, exactly be, uh, when the barrier starts uh, regarding read operations, write operations, and uh, so on. And it's a common thing for C++ and uh, Rust. 
and uh, yeah, I'm not uh, here really an expert, but uh, my friend who encountered these errors uh, needed to get familiar with it, so that uh, there's a risk that uh, each of us may become an expert after experiencing uh, weird uh, optimization issues at some point. And uh, yeah, there are also atomic uh, instructions, uh, which are, well, just instructions which are warranties to be indivisible, uh, indivisible. They will just happen in full or not happen at all. Here I also have a funny story of using some old uh, API back in time. I think it was 10 years ago where we had a swap method and uh, this uh, swap method was just a normal thread hostile function, but it was named uh, as atomic and uh, it had a really old uh, to-do comment to make it uh, really atomic. Okay, here, imagine that uh, somebody is uh, swapping two really important uh, data, which cannot be easily restored in memory, and uh, somehow it was uh, broken uh, during swap, so that one piece of data is lost, and the second one, which wasn't swapped, is considered to be this uh, new piece of data. Uh, yeah, many things may go really wrong in uh, this place. It's like really obvious. And uh, yeah, there are uh, a warranty that uh, some parts of the code will also be serialized uh, so that uh, they will either happen or not happen at all. And uh, yeah, back to what may go wrong, because some people may just uh, assume that, okay, we have some control mechanism. If we use them, we will be all right and nothing bad will happen. Well, unfortunately not. As, uh, uh, as it was already mentioned, uh, uh, happening uh, of many things uh, in almost the same time may be problematic and uh, if we don't have a full control many things may go wrong uh, for example uh, some previous uh, value which is wrong at the moment may be propagated uh, what may lead to some false positives. Here I remember having an issue that uh, some value was checked too early before it stabilized and uh, it was uh, considered a critical error value, even though everything was uh, fine. But if in our system we had all sorts of uh, alarms and everyone started panicking, yeah, it happened <laughs> really a lot of times and uh, in the end, uh, luckily it was fixed. Uh, all of the threads are competing for resources in all sorts of uh, ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, things happening at once, uh, never warranty, doing things in the order you either wanted or assumed. Uh, and uh, yeah, the more common uh, points are there between processes uh, running in parallel, meaning access to the same resources, for example, the riskier it is. Also, the more complex uh, is the multi-threading system, the more uh, risk uh, it uh, gets and there are more potential bottlenecks, uh, which, uh, well, it would be great uh, to find and uh, analyze, uh, but sometimes it's only possible after using the system for some long time. And uh, yeah, some people may also think that uh, threads are fine, threads are lightweight, but uh, each thread requires uh, some system time for context switches, creating them, destroying them, so that uh, creating uh, many threads also may make you stuck. Uh, later on, I will show you several examples of uh, bad things that may happen mostly if you create uh, too many threads and allow them to do things. So. Let's go to the question about uh, worst thing uh, ever, which could be easily, easily a billionaire's question. And uh, yeah, let's think for a while. What is the worst thing uh, in C and C++? 
I guess that in uh, other programming languages as well, yet here it's uh, really likely to occur, that can happen. Is it a runtime crash, some error condition, undefined behavior, or just a slow up performance? If someone is courageous enough, uh, you may reply, I will take another sip of my tea in this exact moment. Yeah, we have uh, one question actually. Uh, have yep. you, yeah, have you ever used C plus uh, plus currencies to avoid uh, context switching? Oh, wait a moment. I will try to. I will try to look at the chat. Hmm. Not Zoom. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing. The coroutines to avoid context switching. Uh, I only used them in a basic way. They are a really fine thing, uh, yet I d I've never actually, unfortunately, used C20 in uh, commercial applications. Yet I have a lot of, uh, let's say, hope that coroutines will be a thing that uh, works uh, really great. Coroutines, okay, well, actually, but if you really want to shoot your uh, coroutines plus uh, real threads, uh, yeah, this uh, would be a problem. Actually, uh, in my point of view, uh, C++ each new standards allows to do more and more completely new things. And uh, sometimes it's uh, easier to keep things simple, what means, uh, well, Maybe not uh, exactly not using anything, but sticking to some programming uh, pattern that uh, makes sense and uh, keeping some consequence uh, in your pro in your project. Uh, I also remember that uh, syntax for coroutines uh, was uh, pretty messy in C++, but still the feature is really amazing and I wish to see it more in upcoming projects in upcoming years. So yeah, let's go back to the presentation then. Okay, it means that I need to start from current slide, yeah. And now do the Zoom sharing thing. So, bam and share. Okay, going back to the question. Hmm, I'm thinking if there are any different things uh, in a new upcoming standards is uh, useful for multi-threading. I don't remember it right now, but I think that uh, coroutines are like the biggest uh, thing uh, introduced uh, right now. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, because I remember there were four big functionalities, uh, including modules and uh, coroutines, uh, but, uh, well, never used it commercially. Uh, right now we are mostly stuck on uh, C++ 17. Yeah. Anyway, back to the presentation. The worst thing ever in C and C++ and most probably every different language is undefined uh, behavior. Why it's uh, bad? Because it's hard to encounter, hard to reproduce and uh, easy to ignore because it's hard to <laughs> encounter and reproduce as well. I remember writing a lot of code in uh, VHDL back in the days and uh, they had a really nice integrated uh, testing environment in uh, Xilinx ISC. Yeah, it was uh, ages ago. And uh, it uh, always uh, showed uh, undefined uh, behavior in red with some X, uh, inst X value instead of actual binary value. 
and uh, it was uh, completely disallowed to even run this code if uh, any such case could happen. Haven't encountered a similar uh, sanity checks uh, or sanitizers. Uh, I only know that they are available and uh, they work uh, fine in most cases. Anyway, it's a really terrible thing. And uh, yeah, let's switch to Godbolt again with a second example. Just need to copy it. This example looks really innocent. I will just need to generate a promising output which shows that everything is fine. Unfortunately, all outputs are already showing the thesis I want to prove. So I will just hide the output and show you. So bam, here is some really simple application. Here we have some threads created, uh, as in a previous case, let's assume there are 15 of them, and each of them gets some argument, which is, well, just some integer. In this case, our function is a bit more complicated because uh, depending on the fact if uh, this integer is even or odd, it does some different things. Uh, seems really trivial, but uh, some uh, wise uh, developer. Okay, I also use log guard here. It just means that at this place uh, some mutex is locked and it uh, gets uh, unlocked uh, once we get out of the scope automatically. So just for clarity. But some uh, wise uh, men who wrote this. Uh, uh, did uh, one thing that uh, is uh, pretty wrong and different for even and uh, odd case. Now the question to you is, uh, do you see what uh, may be wrong with uh, this uh, naive innocent piece of code? Yeah, also an excuse for me to get hydrated, but yeah, go on. Yeah, it will be a deadlock. Yeah, exactly. It will be a deadlock because here I tried to generate output without a deadlock, but I'm still getting a deadlock, which is curious enough because previously my rate was okay. Sometimes it gets even faster uh, because uh, we lock uh, mutexes uh, in a different uh, way in both of these uh, cases so that uh, we may get into a situation where uh, both threads have some uh, lock, uh, some mutexes locked and each thread uh, cannot proceed because it's waiting for the other thread to uh, free its mutex, which cannot be freed because it's waiting for the other mutex to be, fr to be freed. And uh, yeah, we are stuck forever. Here we are getting a nice uh, exception message. Uh, it can be a runtime crash. It can happen anytime. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we are absolutely blocked. See, still, this piece of code looks uh, really innocent. Uh, it uh, may get even worse if uh, somebody is uh, locking and uh, unlocking locks uh, manually and uh, forgets about the proper direction, uh, meaning that uh, uh, locking and unlocking needs to be done in, a, let's say, a asymmetrical uh, way. It's really easy to get uh, confused. Uh, what I can say is I remember uh, writing an application which was uh, safety certificates uh, management and uh, only 5% of uh, its code was uh, working in an okay condition or a happy path. However, remaining 95% uh, was uh, tracking uh, which mutexes uh, are on at any given point and in case of uh, any errors, uh, freeing them uh, in a proper uh, way. 
it was a really problematic and uh, even though we spent uh, more time for this uh, fail safe procedures it uh, crashed as well Okay, apart from deadlock, which I've already presented to you as uh, what can go wrong uh, sort of a problem, there are also different common concurrency pitfalls. Some of them, like race condition, are really common and uh, well known, but there are more of them. Apart from deadlock, there can be a life lock, threat starvation, well, the name says it's all, and uh, there are also some different ones uh, usually connect us to the fact that uh, there are many threads uh, running and uh, something went uh, wrong and uh, they are some sort of uh, panicking. So nice representation of a uh, deadlock uh, you've seen a moment ago is uh, this uh, situation uh, or like a real life situation described on the Quora. Here, uh, mom is asking uh, for a dad uh, to answer someone, and dad is asking for mom's answer, and they will never get it, uh, so that somebody will unfortunately never go on a road trip. There can be also be a life lock case. Uh, life lock uh, is uh, similar, yet uh, threats are not blocked. They are somehow proceeding, but they are, uh, let's say, running in circles in some way, and they are not able to proceed uh, with the execution anyway. A typical example is uh, meeting two people in the corridor and each of them wants to pass the second person and is constantly switching their place so that they are walking, but they are blocking each other anyway. And uh, yeah, there is also a very famous uh, race condition of uh, some things happening in the, let's say, wrong uh, order or uh, basically uh, application execution depending uh, not on some uh, business logic uh, which uh, you are planning to use but uh, one thread uh, accomplishing their work uh, before the other thread so it's some sort of uh, race usually it happens when there are some threads only producing data and uh, some threads uh, consuming the data and uh, a typical conflict between two expressions takes place if uh, one of these uh, threads uh, modifies a memory location which is uh, most probably not protected by anything and uh, the other uh, thread uh, reads or modifies in the same time this same uh, memory location and yeah, depending on uh, which of uh, them starts first, uh, it uh, wins. And uh, yeah, here you can see that uh, I'm talking about a memory location where most probably some primitive uh, value or type like integer or character is stored, uh, one may think. What about objects? Are they, are they like fully safe? Well, no. Here I just uh, referred to a C++ uh, standard definition of a race condition, which only says about uh, locations in memories, but it doesn't say anything about uh, objects. Does it mean that objects are safe from race condition? No, they are actually sometimes even more vulnerable and uh, the situation causes a race condition, but its general name is an API race. And uh, it occurs uh, when the program performs uh, some operations on the same object, but uh, this object's uh, API contract uh, doesn't permit these op operations to be concurrent and uh, uh, behavior is completely undefined in this moment. It happens a lot uh, when uh, you just have some application which was uh, always uh, working and uh, you think that, okay, this is great, I will scale it, I will add some threads because it worked in a serialized way, so what can go wrong? And when there are no access control mechanisms on uh, any of the data so that uh, yeah, weird things uh, happen. 
so that uh, instead of starting with adding some threads, it's a much better way to check uh, which uh, data are at risk of this uh, race control situation so that uh, access to them uh, needs to be somehow guarded. They need to be made uh, atomic operations and uh, so on. There is this uh, problem with uh, threat starvation, which is uh, usually uh, more connected, I think, to the underlying uh, rules of uh, operating system and the way it uh, manages threats. Because sometimes uh, one threat may wait for something to happen, but uh, there is a large wave of other higher priority threats waiting so that this one waits for so long as uh, its uh, job becomes uh, useless. Here a good uh, example is uh, waiting in a restaurant where some people have priority and there is uh, plenty full of uh, such people that has just arrived so that he will wait and uh, you will be starving and you decide uh, just to leave. In this case, you will end up eating your lunch in a different location, but uh, in case uh, of uh, threat being uh, starved, uh, it may mean that some potentially important operation wasn't accomplished. And uh, yeah, it may uh, cause some problems like uh, some values not being updated, some messages not being passed uh, and uh, so on. Unfortunately, there are many possibilities of what may go wrong. And uh, yeah, coming to problems uh, where many threats doing something are involved, there are uh, three of them. I've actually never seen them in uh, practice, but uh, they are really easy to be imagined. There's this problem of a so-called thunder herd. Imagine that uh, there are uh, many threads which are waiting uh, for some uh, object. And uh, yeah, there is this uh, boilerplate uh, or management uh, part of the code, which means that uh, if uh, this object is uh, unlocked, it uh, will uh, awake uh, all the waiting uh, threads to take, uh, take uh, some uh, use of it. And uh, in this case, there are many threads wake waiting for this object or this event, so that uh, some time is a uh, way to awaken all of them. And uh, then only one can get into the critical section, but many are checking if uh, they can win and uh, then uh, going uh, back to this uh, waiting time. And uh, as a result, if there are two threads, where only one of them won and second it uh, some uh, boilerplate activities is fine if there are 20 of them it's really easy to freeze uh, all the application luckily this uh, awakening procedure for example in POSIX and Linux systems is serialized meaning that if one lock uh, went to this uh, shop during COVID sort of a situation and uh, it left the shop, uh, there is only one person, uh, yeah, like standing in a queue and not uh, everyone uh, waiting in the uh, near the entrance to the shop fighting for the entry. You've most probably seen the second situation in a dean office during studying. Uh, that's uh, when I actually seen it happening in practice. So that luckily it's uh, serialized, uh, yet uh, one needs to be aware that such situation may take place, especially if you are doing some more bare metal things on a different operating system. There is also this uh, really popular pro problem. You are most probably familiar with it already if you live in a big city. And uh, it's an actual traffic jam being directly reconstruct reconstructed in your application. Let's imagine that there are multiple threads which are all, let's say, equal and they are competing for the same uh, resource. And uh, yeah, like uh, in case of uh, getting uh, stuck in a traffic, 
Each time uh, one of uh, them uh, wins, uh, but uh, also each time the uh, number of time wasted on, on context switching and uh, all thread state uh, management lasts uh, very long. As a result, uh, you stay on a highway, but uh, you are stuck in a traffic jam and situation progresses, but uh, very slowly because you cannot uh, use the full throughput of this uh, highway. You're stopped. You need some time to start the engine, take some short distance, like move in the queue and then stop again. It uh, is uh, sometimes uh, visible in application when your application works really fast and nice, but suddenly there's a uh, harsh performance uh, degradation. Then uh, this uh, lock convoy is uh, one of the potential root causes that uh, needs to be checked. And uh, uh, there is also one uh, solution uh, which is sometimes uh, recommended uh, where work, when working with uh, threads, uh, just to cache some uh, results so that if several threads uh, need to repeat the exact same operation for the same input data, it's just nice to cache the results so that they don't uh, calculate it from scratch, they just take the result and uh, move on. It's uh, generally any expensive operation result that can be cached, uh, like for example, website rendering, and uh, yeah, it's fine, and as long as uh, the cache doesn't expire, because uh, then uh, all the threads which are waiting here again, imagine not two threads, because then it's fine uh, when you need to recalculate something, but maybe 20 or 30, all of them try to find this data at cache, they miss, it's uh, already taking a lot of time. And then bad thing happens because uh, they try to recalculate this uh, result doing some heavy operation simultaneously and uh, at the same time because they are not aware that uh, all the other threads uh, also missed and are also trying to recalculate it. And uh, yeah, as a result, uh, we are repeating the same uh, operation, exhausting uh, all the resources, making cache completely useless. And uh, if we need to update this information within uh, some uh, given time period, uh, it's uh, possible that uh, all our threads uh, waiting for uh, this uh, cache and uh, trying to calculate things, just time out the operation. And uh, yeah, again, we get a terrible freeze. We don't know what's going on because we are using some nice uh, multi-core machine. But uh, yeah, something went wrong and it might have been this exact issue. Uh, just uh, to end, uh, if uh, such uh, errors uh, happened uh, in uh, like a real life situation, well, I spent a lot of time uh, doing investigation if uh, and the uh, famous uh, computer crash was even backtraced to a uh, multi-threading error. And uh, it seems that uh, one of the famous crashes actually did. It's uh, this uh, problem with uh, radiation therapy machine in Canada, where there were several accidents where patients were given massive uh, overdoses of uh, radiation. And uh, this machine was able to work in two modes, uh, which was electron mode and uh, X-ray mode. And uh, due to race condition errors, sometimes uh, operator was using an X-ray mode, even though they thought uh, it's uh, this uh, much uh, lower dose of uh, radiation electron mode. And uh, yeah, the result was really terrible. Many people died or were seriously injured. So that, uh, yeah, it's uh, never good uh, just to ignore things that have a really low reproduction rate in your code, especially if uh, this is a complex system which heavily uses concurrency. And uh, yeah, as some closing remarks of this part of the lecture, which was really catastrophic, 
I always remember that if something can go wrong, it will, according to the Murphy's Law, like in uh, this uh, beautiful and uh, not so messed up uh, meme uh, down there. There are some general advice uh, what to do and uh, how to live, uh, even though if uh, everyone uh, just used this advice, there would be much uh, less multi-threading errors in the world, at least uh, I assume. Uh, you should never underestimate errors whose occurrence rate is uh, low. Uh, I remember some multi-threading errors in FPGA, which uh, took place like once per 200 runs. Sometimes people just said, okay, it's so uh, low occurrence rate, it will never happen at the customer site, but sometimes it did. And uh, people decided just to automate uh, some uh, night uh, tests so that uh, they are sure that these errors will never ha never happen again. Uh, when uh, in doubt if uh, some uh, part of code is safe, it's uh, really great to use some sanitizers, Helgreen, or uh, undefined behavior sanitizers. It's really great, uh, I also mentioned it before, to be explicit if uh, some methods are uh, too used uh, with uh, threads uh, to use in a, let's say, read-only way with threads or are they completely thread hostile and they should be never used uh, in multi-threading without any external synchronization to uh, make sure that uh, you don't cause any deadlocks. Uh, it's great to be consistent uh, all over your code uh, and uh, symmetrical uh, in uh, both uh, lock and unlock uh, order so that, uh, yeah, at least uh, this part uh, is something that uh, won't take place. Not spending too much time in a critical section, just doing the absolute minimum of what is needed is also a great rule. It's great to stay in the lock as, for as short time as possible. And uh, yeah, there was this uh, nice uh, saying somewhere on Stack Overflow, how not to cause any deadlock. It's, not waiting for another thread if there's uh, some romantic chance that somewhere uh, this exact thread is waiting for you. And it's a nice closing remark for this part of the lecture. I hope that uh, you learned a bit about, at least about uh, what else may go wrong apart from all the things you are aware that may go wrong. And uh, yeah, I hope I didn't exceed the time too much. And uh, yeah, I'm waiting for your further questions now. Please, maybe someone has questions. Oh, some framework uses resource management while using coroutines. Share nothing working model. Hmm. Actually, uh, the approach, uh, I know nobody asks about it, but I really like uh, approach used, for example, in Erlang or in uh, functional programming to multi-threading, uh, yet I've never used it in any large scale application so that uh, I may be enthusiastic only because I haven't uh, seen it uh, break things uh, in uh, real time. <laughs> Share nothing worker model. There's also this nice saying in uh, Go, which uh, goes like, I hope I won't uh, mess it. Uh, I need some hint because I will for sure say it in the wrong direction. Oh, uh, may you tell us about such a thing as lockless structures? Lockless because, structure, yeah, yeah. You didn't mention them. Yeah, I didn't but... mention them. Actually, I wanted to mention them on the second part of this uh, lecture. Yeah, uh, so as I understand it, it's uh, like another approach avoiding uh, locks uh, completely. 
just uh, guessing how many of these errors are connected with the fact that uh, logs are used, uh, it uh, may just well get uh, make us uh, get rid of uh, these uh, exact errors. Well, they do in expense of a little bit of performance. Yeah, uh, same for atomic uh, operations, for example, because uh, I saw some people with mindset that, okay, we'll make everything atomic and it will go fine. But the trouble is that uh, all of these things are ways of uh, optimizing uh, performance uh, at some cost. So that uh, usually a cost of being uh, safe and deterministic means that some runtime, uh, execution time uh, will be spent uh, on doing, t doing uh, it, uh, let's say, behind the scenes. Uh, okay, looks like no uh, questions, and uh, I would like to say thanks, uh, Natalia, for your performance, and thanks all for joining. Uh, you will receive a feedback form recently. Please uh, complete it. Uh, your opinion matters, and uh, we will be happy to see all of you next event. Have a nice day, all. Bye. I just uh, did a really quick uh, Google, oh. and there's mm -hmm. a nice chapter in a book I was just reading uh, to get myself a basic, better understanding of everything. Part of it is uh, blocked because it's under paywall, but there are many parts uh, being available for free. Just let me switch to Zoom. This book is uh, mentioned uh, somewhere in my reading materials for sure. And uh, yeah, there will be a second part, uh, which will mostly be uh, about uh, mechanisms uh, where, let's say, these problems uh, won't uh, take uh, place, as well as uh, some uh, low-level architectural hints uh, or OS uh, hints uh, how to deal with <laughs> the problems uh, I described. Okay, thank you. We will share uh, this uh, link with us after this presentation. Okay, uh, have a nice day, everyone.